Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast and uh, the Jimmy Rex Show. Today I have a special guest. Uh, I am here with Keith Nelson, uh, one of the co-founders of Vivint and founder of several other very successful companies. Uh, Keith, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I don't know if you know this or not. The first time I ever heard your name uh, was through a mutual friend, Cam Jensen, okay. several years ago. Yeah. And he just kept telling me about this mentor he had, Keith, yeah. and uh, over at Vivint. And then, you know, recently, Kyle Van Noy uh, also refers to you as one of his closest friends and mentors. Kyle's a good friend of mine. And that's, I really just kept hearing your name over and over again. And that's where I first was introduced to, to Keith, yeah. the guy well, from, thanks. yeah, so it's pr pretty cool. So you give a lot back to different people. You enjoy working with youth. You've hired so many young people through Vivint, your other companies. Um, is that something that you look for specific talents coming from younger generation people? Or why is it that you've been attracted? So many people refer to you as their mentor. What is it? You know, I, I think it's, uh, if you think about Apex, Vivint, I mean, that's what we built it with, right? And so that's what I'm used to working with is, mm. is young people. I, I, I like working with them. Um, I got a lot of gray hair because of it, <laughs> but uh, no, I just, I like the energy of youth. I like the um, kind of, they're not as set in their ways in a, in a lot of things, uh, but yeah, it's just kind of what we did, right? And sure, so that's the you company You do what you, you do, said, yeah, you're comfortable with them. Um, I enjoy competitive people, so a lot of, a lot of athletes and type of stuff, and uh, we did a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, surveying and stuff to kind of try to help to predict who would be successful in door-to-door -door sales and and the only factor that mattered at the end of the day when we drilled it down was how competitive were they um interesting and it didn't matter how far they went in competitive sports it didn't matter you know were they an nfl football player or whatever but but were they competitive and i think that that's probably what attracts me back to those type of people. Well, and you've been on the record saying that you really enjoy working with salespeople that maybe aren't as experienced or set in their ways. Does that have to do again with maybe it just doesn't play as much of a factor that experience as opposed to that competitiveness? Yeah, and, and I, you know, as, as we've gotten into more enterprise style sales and different things, I would say that there's a little bit of a difference there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's just about people who set goals and go out and achieve goals, right? Um, and uh, the goals change. You know, we saw that the the, the pay scale at at Vivint, mm -hmm. the base of the pay scale was set clear back in two thousand and two, mm -hmm. around an office doing eight hundred accounts and the manager selling a hundred. And, and and those numbers just those numbers are blown out of the water. Yeah, right? um, and it always comes back to everything. If I look at everything that we did right there. It was a lot of it was trying to figure out how to solve certain problems that come about, but a lot of it was just really talented people trying to figure out how they could do better, how they could make more money. And there were a lot of things that uh, had we gone and said, you need to do this, I, I don't think we would have gotten the same reception as them coming and say, can we do this? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, and then by them doing that, we kind of, they kind of started to set, well, this is possible, uh, and uh, obviously they've done amazing things. Well, and I think that was one of the genius things that you guys did over at Vivint was you had such a competitive culture. I'm friends with you know hundreds of the guys over there, and, and they really are inspiring how competitive they got. I remember when they would recruit against each other back in the oh, day, yeah. and you, one of the smartest moves I think you guys made was changing that because they were all so competitive that they started giving away a lot of their bonuses that was, you know, things like that. But that competitive nature, I think, is what kind of grew. And I was going to ask you what, I mean, when the summer sales started, there were so many companies that really didn't differentiate themselves that much, but Vivint won. I mean, you guys rose to the top. Right. What set you apart versus all the other companies that also had competitive guys and different so, things? I mean, if, if you were to ask me, uh, I, it was... I, I can remember it. I can remember walking in and saying to Todd, we're not going to do this any longer. Either we're going to change what we're doing or we're not, we're not doing this any longer. And it was in 2003. We'd left ADT because they had all these problems. Um, we'd been with Pro One the first year. Then they kind of went out of business, really. Um, and then we went with ADT thinking, okay, there'll never be a problem. And then the Tyco issues happened. And then we went to Monotronics and and uh, Montronics, uh, we had a deal with them that they couldn't change the, 
the purchase criteria until at the end of a summer. So every October they could reset the purchase criteria and, um, and uh, at the beginning of that summer they decided to change it like 15 days before and contract didn't matter. Um, and so it really disrupted our business and I used the, the analogy of a summer sales program as you spend eight months winding the spring as tight as you can and then the secret sauce is how do you unwind that spring without letting it spring. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. How do you create that tension and then how do you maintain that tension throughout a summer? And if you unwind the spring, you don't have enough time to wind it back up and you just kind of have to live. And we saw over and over again, um, whether it was in pest control or with 80s, that when we would have big failures, it was because someone else changed the program and didn't give us enough time to wind the spring back up. Um, and uh, I was like, either we're going to become a full service alarm company or we're not going to do this anymore because you and I can't go and do this. We you were done having other people's issues affect your Yeah, business. yeah, and it, it was just, and, and that's just how it is, right? Um, everyone has a business or a life or whatever, and when you come in and try to change that and they don't want to change, um, you run into problems. And so if you take Monotronics, for example, even as we got further down the road, it was they were doing about 60,000 accounts a year without us. So they were cutting in about 5,000 accounts a month. And here we coming along and we're going we're to do 20,000 accounts. So we're going to double the amount of cut-ins that they have. Well, that's kind of an unrealistic thing to think that they can scale up, double their, their infrastructure, mm -hmm. and then four months scale down. Um, that's what we did. So that was kind of what we could do. And we tried to get them to say, hey, let us take over more of this stuff. We can streamline it. We can do all these things. Um, and they just, they just weren't really open to it. And so uh, we bought our freedom, literally had to buy our freedom, um, and uh, went off. And once we got everyone else's, I'm going to say bottlenecks out of the way, we could we really we could expand. yeah and I'm a big believer that especially again I use door to door um, it's it like sports right and in golf one stroke a day over four days is the difference between winning and coming in thirtieth sure. right it's yeah. it's small little things and I think it's the same thing out there it's small little things that happen on a door. Um, that people get consistent. And the one thing I figured out really fast was that salespeople will only sell as many accounts as they think can get installed. Um, and that it will, it will, if they start out really high and they can't get them installed, it will get down to a point where, where it's what they can get installed. And installed is more than just the technicians out there. It's how do you get it cut in? How do you pull the credit? How do you process the paperwork? How do you do all those things? Um, and once we took over full control over that, it just happened. That's when it really took that's that just, hockey that's just stick when, growth yeah. for you guys. And then the second thing was, um, and I think that what really probably separated us was we weren't trying to be someone else. Um, and I always knew that we were in good shape when people were saying, we're going to be just like Apex next year. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, that's really, they're just trying to be us. We're trying to we're trying to do something, something quite different here, um, and uh, yeah, you guys kind of always had your own culture that was everybody knew you know Apex, and you guys were kind of like if you wanted to really go after it, at least that's from the sideline because I was watching the whole time as this right. thing went right. Um, it seemed like Apex kind of had that culture of like, if you want to really go after it in your career, this is where you come eventually. It was you and, you know, there was Pinnacle and a few others at the yeah. time. But Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that, um, you know, the other thing that we did was we spent two years building an infrastructure of technology that would enable us to do all these things. Um, you know, we went from, we went from 20,000, I mean, it took us, seven years to get to 20,000 accounts. People don't, wow. people don't realize that. And then we went from 20 to 40 to 80 to 160. Wow. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, growing the sales team. A lot of it was them just producing way more. But a lot of it was we enabled that to happen. I mean, someone to sell and install 40,000 accounts in a month, 
was unheard of sure. um, and probably still is. They're, they're the only people who do it. And it's because they control the entire process of moving that along. And uh, that was, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a person who looks at and says, okay, what are the bottlenecks? Can we fix those bottlenecks? Can we streamline them? Because if you, and then, then at the end of the day, because you can get to where you can sell too many, mm. right? And then, then we had to make sure, and we were lucky because, you know, in the beginning, every business has the same thing. It's how do I get a customer, mm -hmm. right? Just how can I get? And eventually you have to be to who do I want as a customer? especially if you're in a recurring revenue business. Yeah, really defining who your perfect customer is. Yeah, and it's not even just perfect, you know, and you always have salespeople because salespeople want the net as wide as it can be. Mm -hmm. And then you have the underwriter <laughs> who wants it as, as you know, and, and, and at the end of the day, Vivint really, um, they have to underwrite their customers. They have mm -hmm. to provide phenomenal service. They have to do all those types of things. Um, but then you also have to underwrite them, for lack of a better word. And so... You know, over time, they went from who can we get to be a customer, and we were selling those customers, so I really didn't care that much. Sure. At the end of the day, I really didn't care. Yeah, I'd like to say I customer. did, but I didn't. <laughs> I just wanted a customer that I could sell to Montronics. But when we went in and said, we're going to be a full-service alarm company, I was like, well, now I'm buying those customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to make sure they're getting phenomenal service and doing all those types of things. So it took us two years to put together the infrastructure um, to go and do that. And then Todd and I were really like connected on what we were wanting to do. Um, and well, we had a really good, powerful partnership for a, a long time. And now you guys were best friends growing up, right? I mean, yeah, you've talked we about were, how you kind of accidentally got into the entrepreneurship yeah, world. Yeah, we Tell were, us a little bit about that. So Todd's younger than me. We, we got to know each other my senior year in between my junior and senior year um, of high school, of high school okay. we played basketball okay. and that's how I got to know Todd and we just hit it off we played summer league ball and we hit it off and his parents liked me <laughs> I don't know why um, but they liked me and they figured and, and they're always wor worried when Todd would go out and do things with other people but if he went and did them with me they liked it <laughs> and uh, I was always kind I, I didn't get in a lot of trouble but I was just a normal kid growing up sure in Idaho and we just you know he has 11 kids in his family I had three mm. um, by the time Todd and I got to be friends my brother was gone so it was just me and my little sister at home and uh, yeah we just you know got to be really really good friends and then you know I graduated from BYU with a master's in accounting and was doing uh, working at, uh, at Deloitte and um, you know had had a chance to go run one of my clients businesses the year before just didn't feel right. Everything looked right on paper, just didn't feel right. Mm. Uh, when Todd called me, nothing looked right on paper. It just kind of feel, felt right. And uh, I was at a point in my career where I, you kind of had to go do a national assignment. So I was either going to have to go to um, New York or DC or the Bay Area. And I told my wife, I'm like, let's just treat this like a national assignment. Uh, go over. Um, if after two years we don't like it, I can always come back to public counting. And sure, and if nothing else, you kind of probably figured I'll learn a lot in the process of yeah. doing this startup. Two years later, I was in debt to my eyeballs. <laughs> um, hadn't had a paycheck in a little while, and my wife had no idea. So there was no going back. It was, nice. uh, and uh, it was, you know, and that's, you know, when you're building things, you don't think a lot about, I mean, you think about the risk, but you don't think about the loss. Sure. Um, because you're, all in, right? And if you think about losing, you're... What you focus on, you're going to bring about. So yeah, I mean, kinda... I'm like, I'm like, I've, you know, I look at these other, and all businesses have issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at them and I'm like, man, we, we sat on the edge of the abyss for so long um, that it just became normal. You know, and now it's kind of uncomfortable for me, right? Uh, like, man, this is nothing. I look at the problems at some of the other businesses. I'm like, this is nothing. I mean, we literally, I, I can't tell you how many times that Todd and I'd be like, I sure hope we sell some accounts this summer. You know, do you think we can still do it? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, um, but it was, uh, it, was, it was a good ride. Well, and I think that's part of the story where people don't necessarily see, right? Now they see the name on the side of the Jazz's arena, right? Yeah. And they see all the success that Vivin has had. But I mean, you were in those trenches for years and years before decades. you guys, decades yeah. before you guys popped. Um, when did you know you had something really special? Not just like a successful company, but I mean something really special over at Vivint. Um, 
I tell everybody this facetiously, but it's kind of true. When the check cleared, when Blackstone bought it, I was, okay. I was pretty, pretty confident then at least that it was for me. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, Vivint is a, is a company unlike, you know, a lot of others that are that big and that it doesn't really, it, it, it requires so much capital mm -hmm. um, that, uh, but, I knew kind of when, when we were continuing to grow through the recession that we had something. Um, but it's really hard when you have to rely on capital markets. Uh, capital markets can turn, they did. Um, and we were fortunate that, that we could get capital in those, in those markets and we got it by paying. You know, um, yeah. if people really knew how we financed that thing, they'd be like, you guys were crazy. And I was like, <laughs> You know, it always cracks me up when people come for, for loans and whatever, and they're like, well, that's really high interest. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the cost, right? Yeah, that's yeah. The, the cost to raising, <coughs> excuse me, hundreds of millions of dollars in the middle of the recession is really high interest and really um, tough covenants. Yeah, because yeah, you guys really had, I mean, I think you sold the Blackstone in 2009, and that's really... 2012. 2012. But yeah. 2009 is kind of when, isn't that when you guys started raising debt, or was it... We started raising debt in 2006. 2006. Yeah, but okay. but but uh, in during the, the 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 recession, it was. I remember talking to the Goldman guys, and I was like, "Hey, they're like Keith. There's there's no credit. It's not the high yield market is closed. There is no." Wow. And we kind of got to a point where it was really hard to get. We kind of gotten to the point where, if you think about the banks or the people who fund alarm accounts. They were all kind of in our deal and kind of all at the max that they would do. And so we had to attract new money into it. And, and so to do that, usually you'd go to the high yield bond market and it was closed. We couldn't get in there. And so our idea was, well, what if we gave you uh, high yield interest okay. with senior secured covenants? And Goldman was like, yeah, I think we can do that. And that's how we raised the money. Wow. Um, and then, you know, the beauty of them going with Blackstone is it allowed them to get access to, to real credit markets that we just didn't have the, the ability to do. You know, when I look at the money, um, you know, Vivint could have, if you think about capital coming onto a balance sheet to fund it, Vivint's never had any. Um, all of it was debt financed. And uh, so in a, in a sense, it's kind of bootstrapped itself. But we had to have partners like Goldman and them in order to probably get that, that, that exactly. credit and that capital. Well, and I think one thing that as I've kind of watched you over the years since Vivint, mm -hmm. you've started and successfully helped several new startups, including yeah. Nuvi and Snap Power and a couple others. Um, it seems like for you, you enjoy the growth period of these companies. Was it hard to leave Vivint? And what's the difference between, I mean, well, let's start there. Was it hard to leave Vivint? Yeah. And what was the Extremely hard. And what was the decision making there? What? You know, it was, it was, you know, we'd kind of run this two-headed monster and, and I always tell people partnerships, um, you know, you think that they're built to last forever, but they're not. Mm -hmm. and, and if things don't go very well, then uh, partnerships are easy. But when things go really well and companies grow, um, eventually there has to be a leader. Um, and... Uh, it got to a point where it really couldn't be these two guys and there had to be one and, and, and Todd was always the majority owner and, and really kind of the, 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 the face of it. And so that was what really, you know, probably uh, did it. It was really hard, right? I mean, when you've spent that much time and effort um, into something, it's, uh, it, 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 it was hard. Um, yeah. and, and sitting on the sidelines there for a while, and there were a lot of things. Um, in the end, it was it was the best thing, right? Well, you've had so much um, amazing things happen to you yeah. since then as well. How did you decide what to go into next uh, after after all that? You know, so so I spent two. Th I left in I left December thirty first of 09. Mm -hmm. Um and I spent a couple years kind of doing nothing. Uh, in oh nine, we had a, our 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 third child, so I had a fourteen year gap. 11 years between my two youngest um, and 14 years between my oldest and my youngest. And um, it was really cool for a few years there to kind of be around her. Um, 
and uh, I, I, I missed that with my other kids. Mm. Um, but I also figured out really fast that when you have nothing to do, you get nothing done. Um, the idea of idleness is very, very familiar. So I, I knew I wanted to get back and doing something. And, and we've spent the last five years with this Macaulay. Macaulay stands for Mackenzie, Cole, and Presley. They're just okay, my kids. Great, yeah. And um, trying to figure out what is it that we want to do. And it's really different. Uh, again, it's really different because when, when you have nothing and you're growing something, you don't think about all the risks implied and this and that. You just go and do. And, you know, people have asked me a lot of times, you know, what are the key decisions that you made and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we didn't really make a lot of decisions that were that hard because we really didn't have any choices. It was either do this and try to live or die, right? <laughs> and you just kind of go and do that. Sure. But when you have um, resources, and it's because we had no resources, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. You actually have decisions that you have to make. And and life is a lot more complicated. And, and I've probably realized over time that, you know, I'm probably, I'm probably going to be more of an investor in the future, um, less of an operator. Uh, uh, and I enjoy that. Um, well, you've, it's given you an opportunity to do some of your passions as well. Um, yeah. I know this last May, we, you guys opened up over at UVU, um, the uh, Melissa Nelson Center for Autism, yep. and it's in the building named after your son, Cole, who yep. has autism, right? Yes, yes. Tell us a little bit about that, um, how that came about, and then how you felt that day when you guys opened that up. Yeah, that was a, that was a you know, I met President Holland a few years before, um, and we'd been, we'd been involved with, uh, Cole's 19 now, we mm -hmm. found out when he was two, okay. and we put him through some really intense therapy, and, and he is a... He communicates, he talks, he's potty trained now, which is great, all those types of things. Uh, but he's autistic, right? And um, we were lucky. Uh, it's one of the things that I'll forever be grateful for Todd is that he helped. We, it was really expensive to fund um, his therapy. And we were young. You know, mm -hmm. one of the problems with autism, it affects young kids and young kids have young parents and young parents have no resources. And autism is not something that, that a young family can really finance. And around here, we don't have the public funding for it. And so, you know, my wife was like, you need to get into that. And I'm like, Melissa, I don't, you know, it's an unsolvable problem, right? To me, if it's like, well, can we solve it? Yes, if we can't, then I don't even want to focus my time and effort on it. And so we tried some things with another program called Kids on the Move, where we were hoping to be able to create a sustainable program to help these families. Um, and I always say to everybody, I, I'm not so sure Cole's life is any better, right? It's like, I, you know, he lives a happy life, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but our life is way better. My wife and I's life is way better. Um, the family's life is better. And, and when we got into it with Kids on the Move, it, it became, it was the same thing, right? They didn't have the resources. And so I really wasn't going to get that involved. But when President Holland came uh, to us with this idea. It was their idea. It wasn't our idea. Okay. Um, I was like, that. if there's any place it can work, it's at a public publicly funded university. And they came with this idea. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that, you know, if you are to ask Todd, who probably knows me better than anyone, um, he'd say, Keith only knows two speeds. Gas down, full break. <laughs> um, and I was like, and when we sat down there, started talking about the center they wanted, I'm like, we well, guys need a building. They're like, yeah, but, you know, to build that building, to get the state funding, you know, that's like way behind, you know, we've never done a privately funded building. And I'm like, well, what do you need, you know, and what do we, you know, and we sat down, we're like, well, let's go get it done. And we were able to raise all the private funds in about nine months nice. to go and build that. We obviously had a big um, start in the money there. And uh, for us, it's kind of like where we're going to, where we're going to leave our legacy, hopefully on this valley, um, the Nellisons at least, uh, that because uh, um, autism is a huge, huge part of our life. We have a daughter that has is kind of high functioning autistic as well. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, it was really cool. It was a great day. Cole gave a talk, um, and it's one of those things that I think that you know, ten or fifteen years from now, we're going to look back on it. It's going to have a real, real impact. Um, and and we're already already starting to see that.
Well, and I think that's awesome. I think, like you said, it's part of leaving a legacy, yeah. you know, for your family and, and something that's close to home for you mm -hmm. that, you know, you, it's not like you sign up for something, but it just happens to be a part of your um, life and you're able to help, like you said, because a lot of times it gets missed as the family struggle when they it's, have a child that's autistic. I, 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 it dawned on me one time, I, I remember coming home, because as a parent, you always look at your child you know, and you're like, they miss out on this. Oh, he's missing out on that, and he's missing out on that. And, uh, and I came home, I'm like, Melissa, Cole's not missing out on anything. We're missing out. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a daily, daily, daily struggle. Yeah. Um, and um, so, you know, for us, it was a way that we could hopefully uh, help a lot of other people. And, we, and, and the universe, you know, everybody's like, uh, we're not very involved with it. Um, and again, I'm one of those people that they have great people down there. We let them go and do what they think. And if they need our help or if they want us to be involved, we will. Um, but we're not there to tell them how to go, uh, go and do this. Yeah. Uh, and Teresa and um, Lori Bowen and all those people, they're doing an amazing job. Well, and it sounds like a lot of, in a lot of ways you're probably trying to simplify your own life at this point to really, because when you have resources and money and things like that, like you said, Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, maybe. Yeah. And so you, that decision-making becomes that much more crucial and important of what you choose to spend your time and money towards, right? Yeah. So with Macaulay, um, how do you guys decide? Like, are you the brainchild of it? Like, how do you decide what advent or ventures to take on or what companies to kind of work with and invest yeah. with? Oh, so I have, a, I have a, Kevin Obar and I uh, look at different things. Um, we're probably going to be a little different in the future. Um, it's like anything you, 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 you go in and you do things and, and you learn and you're like, you know, is this what, is this what we want to be doing and stuff? So um, I don't know in the future. I like good ideas. I'm probably more interested in the future and the team. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I want people that have to want to do this. I'm almost like... Um, you know, I, 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 th I think that in today's age, if you think of the truly great companies here in Utah County, almost all of them bootstrapped it quite a ways. Yeah, yeah. And in the day of private, private capital, venture capital and stuff, it's almost like raising capital has become more important than being successful. And so, and, and so I'm probably looking for companies that are a little bit more successful than just needing the capital. Um, I also don't have to do any of it. Um, the, I don't want a job again. Yeah. Uh, uh, and when I say that, people are like, oh, you're kind of lazy. I, I don't want something that controls my calendar. I don't have a personal assistant. Well, well you, you have a lot of hobbies too. I mean, I know, you know, I run into you all the time. We yeah. both go to a lot of football games, yeah. watch the Patriots and Kyle, yeah. and you also are racing horses yes. now and these other things. And so is that more, you don't want a job because you want to be able to do these other things you'd rather enjoy doing and spending this time with family and friends and things okay. like that? You know, uh, it's just I, 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 I want to have control of my schedule. And it's not so much, I mean, the horse racing is a big deal to me. Yeah, um, tell us a little bit about that. How would you get into that? I grew up in Idaho. It's kind of, it's a long story, but I'd done thoroughbreds for a little while. Todd and I did. It, 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 it wasn't the most profitable thing, but... Uh, then I got involved, I bought a mare, bred her. Um, now we own quite a few mares. We're actually a pretty big breeder. And uh, you know, if you're gonna do that, you, you kinda gotta get into racing a little bit. And so uh, I, we actually raised this horse. I named him KVN Corona after Kyle. Okay. His, 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 the horse's sire or dad's named Corona Cartel. And um, he, uh, so we took him to the cell. Macaulay's in the business of producing and raising yearlings and then selling them as yearlings. So we go to the cell, and I think it's bad practice to, to keep your best ones home and go and try to raise. So we take them all to the cell, and then Macaulay's not really, Macaulay's designed to like produce a return for, 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 for its owners and stuff. And horse racing is not a very good place to go and say, I'm going to make money racing horses, okay. right? It's kind of like people saying, I'm going to make money going to Vegas. Or going into the movies or something, maybe like something. A I don't even know movies, my, but, but, but it's like, I mean, it's a sport, right? Sure. Um, yeah, that makes sense. 
but I really love this horse and uh, his full brother was one that I really loved that we'd sold and so I went and decided I was going to try to buy him and I didn't want it to be that so I went and said I'll pay X dollars for him. I didn't tell anyone publicly. Um, I went to the back of the arena where no one could see me and bid and I had two, I had, I had one bid left. My, my, my limit was 150000 for this horse and um, I was worried because the bidding was going in a way that I wasn't going to get to bid one fifty. dollars mm -hmm. um, And so then it, it got to the point and it, it hit one forty, dollars and, and, and that's what I got him for. And um, my plan was that if he couldn't make it as a racehorse stallion, I was going to turn him into a barrel racing stallion. And um, we put him into training and uh, he looked like the real part and uh, he's undefeated. He was six starts as a two-year-old, won them all. Won two big stakes, a million dollar stake and a four hundred thousand dollar stake, and uh, wow. hopefully next week he'll be champion two year old Colt, and uh, we're gonna go run him as a three year old, and then he gets to be a dad for the rest of his life. But uh, horse race, if I could do anything, that's probably what I'd do. Um, well, I watch you right now, just lighting up, talking about it. Yeah, it's, it's a passion. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, and it's you know one of the hardest things with you know I grew up in a very normal middle class family in Idaho. Um, my parents live in the same house they've lived in their whole life. Mm. Both of my grandparents lived in the same house. And our life is very, was very simple. And growing up, it was really simple. And I think in a lot of ways, business was really simple because we didn't, we didn't have a lot of choices. Our circumstances dictated our choices, right? It wasn't... Um, and the more resources someone has, the more choices they have. And then it gets really complex. And, you know, Kyle and I talked a lot about that um, and Marissa, Kyle's wife, about, hey, you're, you have choices, right? And the resources that are coming to you, the way it works with these guys, it's just too much, right? Mm -hmm. Because cause it's, it's not like those are choices forever and, and you're really not prepared. So you have to upfront make a lot of those decisions. Mm -hmm. You have to make some decisions as far as what are you going to do with those resources? How are you going to do that? And you have to have a plan because if not, we're all, we've all been raised, most of us, that our life dictated our, our, our choices. Right? Sure, and most people, as life comes, they yeah. decide how they go yeah, from my, there. My car was dictated by how much I made. Sure. The house was, was a formula, right? Um, and when you have resources, then you have to start making choices up front. I probably wasn't prepared for that. Um, uh, and uh, So is that a lot of what you've tried to do? Because so many people, again, refer to you as their mentor. Is that a yeah. lot of what you're helping them through that process? You know, I mean, it, it's different with different people, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, with Kyle, it's that. We, we're, we're a real resource to him as far as helping him to make choices, right? We don't make any of those for him. We right. just try to help him to see. And he has a goal. And, and his goal is he, from an economic perspective, is to have X amount of money when he's done playing. Um, and I'm like, Kyle, you need to focus on playing and, and earning that money. Um, and then at the end, we'll see where you're at, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but if you make choices like a lot of those people do, which is, hey, I just got paid this much money, I'm gonna go spend it all and do whatever, right. it can go in a hurry. Yeah. It, it is not hard to spend a million dollars. People think it is. Especially when you're trying to cater to families, audiences, entourages, yeah. all these yeah. things that those guys have to yeah. deal with. And when you're surrounded by people that are, that, that are doing, doing that, well. right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I've been real, I mean, they've done, you know, they've done really well. Um, been really smart and but a lot of that was decisions they made before and then sticking to it and obviously the best decision Kyle ever made was marrying Marissa For sure, by right. far <laughs> um, and and a lot of it is not only are they just a great couple she's a real real rule keeper mm -hmm. um, and Kyle could probably well, I watched the, the change in bit. him when he started yeah. dating Marissa. They met at, uh, back up at my date yeah. auction, and yeah. so um, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, but I watched the changes that he immediately made from changing his phone number to everything else in yeah, between. Yeah. She really helped ground him. And yeah. Did you do a lot of that with the Vivint guys as well? Because so many of them, I think, um, they get this money same, on a smaller right. scale, but same thing. They got all this money they never right. thought they'd have at one time. How did you help those guys or what advice would you give to summer sales guys now that are just getting that money and what did you back then? 
you know, I, I, I'm always, again, most people's lives are set by their paycheck, yeah. right? And, and I saw it when I was at, at Deloitte. It didn't matter how much someone, you know a lot by doing someone's taxes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would have everything from professional athletes to lawyers and doctors and business guys. And so when you're doing their tax return, you know a lot. You know how much they make. Um, you know how much their car costs because they're trying to, mm -hmm. you know, do their lease. You know what their mortgage interest deduction is. And you also know how much money they're putting away for retirement. Mm -hmm. And it, it, what I realized was it didn't matter how much they made. It was conscious decisions would dictate those things, right? And most people spent, they lived their lifestyle according to how much, how much they made. And so I just tried to tell you guys to say, hey, no one will tell you these things because this isn't real, right? This isn't real that someone comes out and can make $100,000, $200,000, whether in college or, right. or just out of it. And, and, I, and I say the beauty is, is that you get it in big checks. Because if you get it one twenty-fourth every two weeks, you're just going to adjust your lifestyle to it. So when you get those big checks, learn to live off of your normal money and then be able to take those big checks. And, you know, I was a big proponent of maxing out your SEP. You know, they had the ability to do that, maxing out your SEP, putting that money away. Right. Again, I'm like, no one's going to tell you this because no, you don't have to tell that to people. Um, and just, 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 you know, trying to prepare for, for when you're not there. Um, and some of them have done a good job. One of the hardest things is, and even as, as someone who went out and, um, built a business is we're, we're kind of adrenaline junkies. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've learned over the last few years, there's a difference between being an investor and a trader. Um, we're trying to be investors. Uh, investors know that it's it's about consistency over time. Um, traders, it's all about trading. You know, finding an edge and trading. And most entrepreneurs, most salespeople are traders. Mm. That's who we are. We're we're betters. We're gamblers. Sure, we want to yeah, go yeah. do those types of things. Um, and that's what you have to be to be an entrepreneur. You can't be an entrepreneur and be an investor. Right. It, it, yeah, you have it. to be willing to gamble everything over yeah. and over again. It's the yeah, constant it's, it's, with it's, it's, every entrepreneur, right, right, as they put you know, their balls on the line right. over and over again. And, and as a salesperson, so they have to fight that, 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 that competitive trader in them mm -hmm. to say, how do I go and, and have something at the end, right? Because if not, your lifestyle can adjust. Um, and we'll see how, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see in the end how, how it works for them. I, I've always pushed people um, to try to pay your house off. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a bad financial decision. That's, the, uh, that's the accountant in you though, right? Yeah, I mean, that but little bit great, safer, more. Yeah. Because you're, you're always going to be living your life out there. Mm -hmm. It's just who you are, right? So why not have a few things? And, and, and I know you're into real estate, right? And all that type of thing. Yeah, I was lucky enough to sell your cabin um, for you a few months yeah. ago. But, uh, but there's a difference between an investment and your home. 100%. I'm a big believer yeah, your in Your home's that. not an investment. Yeah, my home is where my family and I live. Yeah. Uh, and so I kept trying to say, hey, is that your home? Then, you know, if you can, pay it off. And I understand, you know, that's how we funded Vivint was we paid our houses off and then we had lines of credit against them. Um, probably wasn't the smartest thing, but, but enabled us to, to, to do it. But if you can have your house paid for, um, you can probably take a little bit more, more, more risk. And then the other thing I always told them was do what you do well, you know, um, and, and if you want to invest, invest with people in what they do well, mm. uh, you know, so, uh, don't go out and try to figure out how to not do what you do because you do it really well and that's, that's the best way for you to make the most money. Right. But then learn to live on a set amount of money. Again, you have to budget yourself. Um, if you make a half a million dollars a year, you can spend it really easily. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I first got into real estate, you know, I sold 98 homes my second year as a, and I had all this money come in and literally at the end of the year, I had no money. Yeah. And I was like, how did that just happen? And it took, I had to dive in and really become my own little accountant before I finally started saving some money that's because right. it just disappears. And what I say is your life, you, that's the complexity, right? Uh, you know, 
my life right now, my life is very complex now. And it's very complex because I have a lot of choices. Mm. Um, and resources give you choices. And if you consume them all, then you have no choices. And uh, so right. I'm trying to help those guys to get to the point where they're actually making choices. And usually they, the choices they made were, okay, we're going to live on a budget that's still, you know, I, I hate the word budget because budget. It's restrictive. It's restrictive, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, so, but my wife and I have done that forever. We live on a budget. Um, it's, I, I don't call it a budget. We have an, an a, a, I don't know what you'd call it, but, um, but if you can learn to do that and it's a great life, right? Well, then you, you have all these, these other things. But if you don't set anything and you just spend what comes in, um, you will spend it all. It's wow. just, it's just. I call it the checkbook principle. What goes in the checkbook gets spent. Well, and you really had an eagle's eye view because so many people that you were kind of overseeing yeah. there at Vivint. So what advice, we'll kind of end with this, but what advice do you have to people coming out of college right now that they're trying to decide, do I go the summer sales route? Do you think that's for everybody? Do you, what advice do you give people as they're now graduating college or in college, I guess? Um, you know, I, I, I think that... Uh, I, I, I don't really talk to a lot of people about whether they should do summer cells or shouldn't do summer cells. Um, I do believe the golden age is kind of over a little bit mm -hmm. as far as that kid coming home from his mission and, you know, I mean, a lot of the same VPs and the, were there when I was there. That was eight, yeah, nine the years. Growth opportunity the, yeah, it's yeah. just, it, it, it's different. I think it's a, there's nothing that you can make more money at, at that age than that. Mm -hmm. There's just not. I'm a big believer uh, in technology. Um, I believe that people need to learn how to write code and understand it, not be afraid of it. Not that they have to be the engineer, but technology to me is the future. Um, and you know, my, my advice to people, you know, and sometimes my advice is also, you know, if you wanna be, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, right? Especially here. Yeah, especially in Utah. Especially sure. in Utah, right? Todd told me that when I first came here. He's like, dude, there's guys that have been at Novell for 16 years, but next week they're going to go do a landscaping business or whatever. <laughs> um, very few people are really cut out for it. Mm -hmm. it it's just the, the, the facts, right? Because um, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to give it all. And your family has to function around that. Yeah, there's no more nine to five, you know. There's no more like, hey, I worked my 40 hours. You're always working you're, when you're not. It's entrepreneur. not only that, but it's it's... It's your, your family life functions around that. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa and I went on one vacation in 16 years wow. that wasn't with Apex people. Uh, it's just that there just wasn't time for that. Um, and so if you want to be an entrepreneur, you, your family have to understand that it's all in. I do not believe, I believe there's a fallacy that's taught in in school and that's taught in our religion, okay? Um, the dominant religion around here, and that is about a balanced life. Um, I do believe there's a balanced life. But people think about it like it's a balanced life at a specific point in time, and that's not true. If you wanna do something extraordinary, your life will consistently be out of balance. Mm -hmm. um, I view it more the thing that there's a time and a season for all things. and and that when you look back on your life, hopefully it was balanced. But if you want to do something extraordinary, your life is going to have to be tilted towards that. You know, with Kyle and Marissa, I mean, Kyle has to be focused on football and it has to dominate their life. Right. Um, and, and for us, there was a point where, you know, when I was in college, it was all about school and finishing and then starting your career and then doing the Apex Vivint thing. It was all focused on that. And now that we're kind of done, maybe now we're a little bit more philanthropic or doing some of these other types of things. And hopefully, when I look back on my life, it was a balanced life and we were hopefully able to do some extraordinary things. 
But if you're going to be completely balanced all the time, you can't do anything extraordinary. No, I love that you said that because, you know, Tony Robbins is one of my favorites and he talks about you have to take massive action towards one thing and that focus right. is what you really like. Anybody that's great at something, that became the focus of their life, right? right. For at least a season. At um, least. And sometimes a it's a very season. long season. Yes, that's right. exactly. And so I think that's such valuable information there. And, you know, I think the ultimate goal is, yeah, ideally you have a will and everything's balanced, health and family yeah. and friends and vacation, fun, all these different things with work. But that's just not reality. If you want to do great things, you have to put, you know, I had a guy, he's 24, he's getting into real estate. He called me the other day to go to lunch and he said, you know, he said, well, I've got all these things I want to do and I want to do real estate. And I said, dude, if you have a life for the next five years, you'll always be average at real estate. You'll never be exceptional because it takes that 70, 80 hours a week for four or five years to then be able to focus on other things as well. It was, I can remember like our third year in business, we'd done uh, 7,600 accounts in a summer and we were at a conference and the guy, uh, Steve Gribbons, he ran ADT. He's like, Keith, I need to get you to do this year round. And I was like, Steve, um, he goes, if you can do 7,600 in a summer, just imagine what you could do all year. And I was like, I, don't, I think I can do more. And I said, the moment, that, the moment that I don't think we can do as many, then I'll come talk to you. Um, and he looked at me so weird and I'm like, Steve, I think that we can, you know, th this, this is, if you can, if we can compact that, we can just do more. We can create way more energy and grow and blah, blah, blah. And, and I think it's kind of that. It was like, mm -hmm. it's like phenomenal focus for a shorter period of time. Um, and it has to be all in, you know, every, everybody looks at door to door, um, and they're, they're like, oh, well, you just go hire a bunch of return Mormon missionaries and they go out. And I was like, well, if it's that easy, there'd be a ton of them. Sure. Um, it's really how do you focus so much energy on a short period of time? Um, because because it, it, and, 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 and how do you go from zero to 100 and back to zero? Mm. Uh, and to me, it just requires so much planning, so much effort, so much focus, and so much out of balance, right? Um, but as I've looked at, looked at that, that's, that's, and if you want to be ordinary, right, um, you can have all of that. Sure. Um, yeah. And those are people who work jobs that nine to five, um, and those are great. And I'm not, I, but people need to understand that if you want an extraordinary result, you have to do the things that most people aren't willing to do. Everyone says they're willing to do it. Um, very few really, really are. And very few families are willing to do. My wife probably, she, she, she would understand now. She likes where we ended up. Sure. But, but it, was, it, was, it, it, it was hard. And, 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 and uh, I think at the end of the day, it's the only, it's the only way I, I know how to, you know, again, it's that break or gas. I just, I don't know where I came from. But I think that's from. gotten you where it has. Yeah. What a blessing that that is how you're walking. Now I need to figure out how to like, like do it a little bit. Put it on cruise control every now and then. Yeah, and like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and that, that's Kevin's job now. Kevin knows that the only way he gets fired is if I run an operating company again. That's great. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but no, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of people ask me, are there things you'd change? I, I'm not someone who thinks about that either. Sure. Um, I'm like, yeah, there's lots of results I'd love to change, but I, you know, you go and you do the best you can and you make the best decisions you can well, and, I, and I, you live with those. Right? I like to say like in that moment, you were dealing with the limited knowledge that you currently had at that time. Yeah. So as long as you know, I gave my best that I had at that time, yeah. there's really no regret. You know, Absolutely. there's nothing to change. So. The only, th I, and, and again, the, the, the only regret you, and I don't have any of those. Like I have no effort re regrets in my life. Yeah, there are some things I wish I could take back, right? But there's no amount. I, I, I've never thought, well, I didn't give it my, the full effort. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where are there things I'd change? Yeah. When I did them, would I have changed? Probably not, you know. Um, but, you know, it was a, it, it, it's, it's been great. I never thought I'd live in Utah, like mm -hmm. ever, ever. Um, and uh, when I left... Um, it was Apex at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, my wife's from Denver. I'm from Idaho. We had no family here. 
we and uh, I said, well, because we were about ready to do some. Well, we've redone our house now to a point where no one should do what we've done, <laughs> and we were about ready As to a go. Realtor, I would advise you not to. Yeah, do that. yeah, okay. we've we've uh, we've replaced the entire exterior of our house, all of the landscaping, and the interior of our house. The only thing left is the walls. Some of them, um, bad decision. But we loved where we lived. Sure. And I was like, hey, before we go about doing this, we need to decide: do we want to live here? Right, because there's nothing keeping the business isn't keeping us here now, and and we decide, hey, this is kind of home, and our kids had a really good, uh, we have a really good support system there, and so you know, um, we've decided that this is where we're going to be, um, and uh, uh, try to put you know some little deeper roots in, and now it seems the families are starting to show up here. Um, but we like it here in Utah County. It's a little different. Well, it's pretty cool. You've left a mark here, you know. This is, you have so many friends and f resources and everything else here now. So yeah. your journey's an amazing one. Well, I, we'll I, see. It's been a pleasure. And I've really enjoyed getting to know you more the last couple of years as we've worked together. You, you tell a lot about somebody when you work together helping them sell a, a house because it's an emotional thing, right? Yeah. And I mean, you were amazing to work with. And My wife was a little more emotional about it, but I was. Well, I was dealing with you, so yeah. I never yeah. saw that side. Yeah. But no, it worked, it worked out great. Yeah. And, well, I appreciate your time. Well, I think people coming. will love this. All right. So, thanks, thanks, Keith, so much. Thank you. Cool.